Today I'll be showing you 30 base building tips, tricks and ideas that will hopefully get you on the way to becoming a master architect in No Man's Sky Beyond. We'll cover things like glitching in multiple forms, how some of the base power items work, a combination lock design, efficient farming and more with just lots of cool little ideas to spruce up your building. So let's get right into it. Okay, so this one is adjacent to glitching. It's been around for a long time now, about just over a year, and um, it's a very, very useful thing. So say in this example, we have this flooring, which is slightly too close to that, but you want it to go neatly toward it. But if you put this here, you can't place that. Now, obviously th th this is just an example, so it's not gonna be perfect, but if we put this here, we can then use adjacency glitching to uh, use this frontage and adjacency glitch by pressing build and the arrow to pretty much the direction that the item you want to glitch almost at the exact same time to get a floor in there so that's now glitched it in it's uh, used the sort of green light from this to transfer it over to the next thing so we can do that with the other door to get it in the center of this as well and there, that is now centered on a uh, square thing. So it's useful for definitely big time, useful for getting things to go in a specific place due to snap points that you couldn't otherwise do, like getting this completely centered on one of these, which really helps for just expanding the ability of building. Now you may want to do this, but obviously you don't, oh, that's at the door with it. You may want to do this, but uh, you don't want that small one. So get, getting that small one out of the way when the big one's there can be difficult. So a way you want, might want to do this is uh, put it above and then do it like this. So then what you're snapping in isn't the scaffolding isn't mixed in and difficult to get out because these things always work on like a bottom point. So the bottom point for this is the bottom center here. So if you put it to a floor from this, this position it is now, the uh, floor will go and, uh, well, I'll show you. The floor is then intersected between both of them. It's perfectly centered between them. And that's the base, very basics of adjacency glitching. You can do it with anything that is next to each other. Say, for instance, you wanted the stairs, a small stairs, to be centered. There you go. The small stairs is now perfectly centered on the big flooring. And it looks pretty good. Now, for some reason, stairs are a little janky in Beyond. There's, you have to do things in certain order. So, with this, you cannot put a stairs like that, because that is there. So that becomes an issue. You can't put a floor underneath the stairs that's already there like this so if you want to get stairs that's above a floor as well as has a floor in front you need to do it in a specific order so essentially to do that just delete this one have these two here have the floor underneath already there place that in or you know the actual stairs <laughs> place that in and then uh, place the floor here and that's the order you have to do. You have to do the one underneath, and then the stairs, then that. That's the only way you can get it to uh, go like that. There are a number of ways to do some really cool things like stair railings. So say we have a little path going this way, and we want to put some stairs to raise the path up a bit so it goes above this ground. Well, we can do this quite easily by using the short wall first, put those there just to raise, just to raise what's coming. Then we uh, extend that out a bit, then use the sloped wall, place that on top of this wall. Now unfortunately without something behind it it's a bit difficult sometimes, it won't just switch. So in order to uh, turn that around, use a wall here, put a wall there, delete that one, and then uh, put this here and you'll be able to flip it then. So delete that or first put the other side in because that would probably be a good idea. Put that in, put the other sloped wall in, delete these two, because they're just scaffolding, and then you can put your stairs in. You can't do it usually 
the other way around. You have to put the stairs in last because stairs don't like things going halfway up it. Same with flooring. Then continuing from this, say you want uh, a little raised walkway with railings, uh, a nice way to do that as well as showing it uh, to support, then you can use some arches. Uh, these, Both of these methods were suggested to me by John Hall when I was doing the Christmas build last year. And it looks really cool. So you just put these in for as long as you want. So let's just go a couple. This adds both support for the uh, raised railing as well as adding, well, a railing itself. You can then put the floors in. And as with the other, you can't usually do this afterwards. You can't put the... Uh, arches in after the floors and there you have a nice uh, path with some supports and it's raised the grass will never end up coming back through these floors and stuff and yeah looks really nice so this next tip is actually about extending your base boundary which is incredibly useful your base boundary is generally about 300 u this says 305 when it switches but that's most likely due to uh, a height difference. So we're well, well about three, 304 that it switches. Extending your boundary is so useful because it allows you to reach multiple hotspots as well as just different areas. And from what we know, you can extend it to a thousand U radius of your base terminal. Now you extend it by essentially getting just on the edge here where you can reach it. You can do, you can use anything a lot of people say they like to use wires uh, just because it's free and doesn't actually uh, cost anything. For some reason this is giving me a little trouble doing the wire. I personally usually go for structures and just build a wall because then it's big, I can see it. Um, you only need a few carbon on you to do it. You can just then run ahead um, and just keep pressing this. And as you can see, I'm able to build outside of what previously would not let me build. So we just built this. Now I am how far away? 413U. I'm over 100U outside of the default radius and I'm able to build. Now if we run off to the side here, it won't take too long before it doesn't allow me to build again. And there we go. I can now no longer build because I'm outside of the radius. The radius doesn't extend all the way around. It extends around what you're placing. So... Uh, yeah, very useful to know that, especially for anyone who wants to build any kind of factory because you'll want to build the factory itself around the actual S-Class hotspot of whatever you've chosen and then find a nearby electromagnetic to go and extend the base perimeter to uh, get your pylons up. And yeah, hope that helps. Okay, so this next one is regarding electromagnetic generators, and it is lovely and simple. I've used it on stream and in my videos multiple times already. It just makes for some nice looking things. And essentially it is that electromagnetic generators can stack on top of each other to make some really cool towers of electricity. This is great for just getting that crazy tower look. Like uh, on my survival stream on the last Sunday, I stacked about, probably about 12 or so on top of each other, going from the bottom underwater from my electromagnetic hotspot. And then from the tower, I got the wires to uh, go down to pylons. And as this is such a similar thing, the next tip is pylons. So when you're doing stuff like this, with like the pylons, when, you st when you're stacking these electromagnetic generators and stuff going for a basic aesthetic, maybe consider doing pylons. So uh, a, a one I used, which I felt worked quite well, was doing these half arches and doing them both sides. Put it up like that. Then you can get some uh, wiring gum on the edge of the thingy, thingamadoo there. Uh, so the top one might go to the top here. Um, and the also go to here. So you can place the, wa the wires on top of like walls and stuff. Or you can do what I did on my stream, 
which is I moved to decorations and got lights. Now, the lights look really cool on the ends of these things. And uh, you could do some different colours to do with, like, uh, I believe someone mentioned, like, the navy stuff, where you have red and green. And uh, this is what I did. I basically took the wires from these. Um, which side is that? Yeah, and then take that, because it's the second one down, take it from that. And uh, take that both sides, and then these basically go, on mine, it goes for uh, six total wires to every hundred U being a, uh, a new pylon. And they look pretty damn cool. So yeah, high recommend, nice little style tip there. I would like to warn you heavily about doing things like this. This is a very nice sort of easy way to clear space neatly. The bad thing is that the game does not keep all these terrain edits you've made particularly, uh, well, for a very long time. They'll eventually grow back. So doing this and building your base underground in such ways where they used to be ground just naturally uh, this, over time, will just fill in again, and everything you put in there will be buried, and you'll have to re-terrain manipulate, and yeah, it's just not good. It's generally a good idea to avoid doing this wherever possible. A lot of people do build underground, but they use existing cave systems for the space. Now, this is a bit of an odd one. Now, it's definitely, it's, it's just so strange. Yeah, there's actually nine silos here. One of them is further back, which you can see. And then this other one here is actually eight in the, the same space. And they're all connected via a single pipe. And if you look into here, not this one, sorry. If we go into this, you can see that the overall storage is 10,250. The 250 is provided by this gas extractor. The rest is from this and then these nine. Now this could be used to save space or in weird ways. It's it's definitely a little like a weird exploity one, but does it really give you anything other than just being able to put crap ton in a single space? I don't know how it would differ in performance, but if you wanted to do it, here's how you do it. <laughs> so first we we'll just get rid of all these and uh, then get rid of that pipe and I'll show you uh, Okay, it actually placed quite a few pipes. If you uh, head up here, so once this is in, everything is going to be basically built off that snap point. So you need to snap from this and have it go to there so it's green lit. And then over to adjacency glitcher in. Between each time, move back. Between each successful time. I'll just now quickly time lapse it so you can see that I'm not pulling any weird cuts. Okay, so I've now done that quite a few times. And uh, if we now look in here in the extractor, there's now 19,250 storage, which means there are 18 in that small area. <laughs> if we just uh, want to clean this up, we delete the back one, which is what we were glitching off. So only do that once you've got as many as you want in there. We can go and delete pretty much all of these except for one we should still have access now that we've connected one that should connect all of them just because they share the same space and there we have because we deleted the one remember we got 18 18 uh, available which is pretty crazy so yeah i hope that's helpful <laughs> A great tip that Golden Geck has been using a lot recently and noted to me about is to use custom markers to work out distances in your build. It's really good for getting exact numbers. So if you use your analysis visor, you can see just below the sort of reticule area, there is a count of how far what you're looking at is. Now, if you want, say, exactly 100 U from this area, then just perfect it there it's difficult to get to the because it has the decimal and there we were pretty close every time i get it bang on it just goes off a little bit so uh, if you then when you're on about the u that you want 
just uh, press the E button if you're on PC. It'll be a different button for for other platforms, but uh, it'll drop this custom marker. It's rather useful indeed. As you can see here, it actually adds a little thing that comes down, which is really good. Uh, one of the new things added in Beyond. Highly recommended for getting those exact numbers and plotting your building site. Of course, you can only have one per building site though. And uh, if you essentially put, you can either get rid of it by pressing E, or you can add another one and the old one will disappear. There we go, very useful. As you can see here, things are upside down. So one of the multiple methods of turning things upside down is to use a little pipe here. And uh, when you move your cursor up and down, you can see that it flips. So what you want is for this pipe to flip upside down, which is basically when your cursor is closest to top, when you're doing this on the bottom of another pipe. So once it's in that stage, you need to adjacency glitch to the left, to the paving. It can be a little tricky, so don't worry about it. It might take you a few times. And here we go. We've got that upside down adjacency glitch from the pipe. Then with this, it's pretty simple from now on. You've now got a point upside down that you can snap a wooden floor to. So get your floor snapped to it. That floor is now upside down. So anything you snap to this floor will also be upside down. Shabuya, plenty of stuff. And uh, this is really useful for just having a number of different ways of doing things. One, one of the most useful parts is being able to make these upside down. So you could do this just outside of your current build. Say for instance you want to use this but upside down so this comes up to a point. You can use the snapping from this floor already here. Go to the paving, snap that onto this. You can then adjacency glitch from the paving to the pipe. Then you can glitch back from the pipe underneath to the paving upside down. Then when you're paving upside down you can then delete this one. I would suggest before snapping this get rid of this snap point which will very possibly make it upside down so you'd want one like here to save this spot although you've got the roofing as well so that's fine then put this in which will be upside down switch to this and get it in the right location you need to, it can be a bit tricky sometimes to get it on snap point but there you go then put another floor in back there and happy days you now have this glitched upside down perfectly it is snapped and beautiful, and yeah, looking good. Another cool one that looks really good at night is to use the wiring to make, well, letters and writing and neon signs, and it looks pretty cool. So obviously this is really quite simple. To do this, just uh, get to your wiring, and then just write. Obviously you might want to do it a little more, well, neater than I've done it. But uh, then, once you've uh, done this to get it quite as neat as possible, put an output out the back there, just so you haven't got other things messing with your flow. Now the dot on this is probably going to be somewhat tricky. We might just do, we might have to just do a little uh, dash there, and then bring that through, make sure it's as straight as possible so it's not interfering with the lettering. Then we can connect these to uh, the live and there we go, we've got a shadaisy with an exclamation point. Another thing you could do is uh, you could strobe it between red and blue, you could turn it red or blue. Um, to do that, just basically invert the signal, make sure it's not powered. Though if you completely disconnect it from the system, it won't be lit up at all. In order to make it red or be able to basically change it, you'll need to use a power inverter, connect it through it to one of the back ones here which connects all of them, connect this to the power. Now, to make it red, you'll need to connect the power also to the modifier. But this won't turn it red automatically. You'll also need to add something to be powered for it to count as being red. So this kind of works as anything. The easiest is probably a light. Obviously, that will actually uh, affect the actual light if it's turned on. But if it's turned off, it's really not an issue. So let's wire that up and then it'll turn red because it's not receiving power. And now your Shadaisy is red. 
If you want to turn it blue, uh, remember that light will shine through in this particular setup a little bit. So just uh, delete that wire and uh, it is now blue. But you can't really see the light much from that thing. There you go. Depending on the build you're trying to go for, wires can sometimes be unsightly. As you can see here, it's just a big wire coming down from there where there's some generators. But there are ways to neaten things up. So one of the ways which uh, I quite enjoy is to use your terrain manipulator, get it the slowest setting, to change the size on PC, it's R to go smaller and T to go larger. Then make a little hole going just pretty much straight down, but not, not exactly straight down on a bit of an incline, just so that you can uh, actually reach down there with your cursor. You can't really point directly down, so that makes a bit of an issue. Then make another hole pretty much directly under where your, where your source is coming from. Now obviously most sources won't be on top of a giant sort of crane thing. So now we have two nice deep holes, we can switch to building mo mode again, get the wire out, get this connected to the generator at the top, then connect it to the hole without falling in, take it all the way down, then take the wire over to the other hole, this other hole which we placed pretty much directly under a connection point. Place that at the bottom again and then bring it up. We can then use the create part of the terrain manipulator to uh, fill the hole in. And there we have a nice neat area. All you see is that little bit there which you can cover with other things uh, as the wires phase through pretty much everything. We can get rid of this old wire here and now it's uh, a lot neater. Obviously on this example there's one coming all the way from there, but most of your stuff's, you know, it's going to be on the ground most likely. Okay, so this one is probably the biggest deal. This is called the wire glitch. It has kind of replaced tier 2 glitching, because tier 2 glitching is not a thing anymore. But uh, this has way more properties. The only thing you can't do with this that you could do with tier 2 is you can't use snap points because it just doesn't work that way. Uh, this was found first by Kibbles. He is a legend in uh, building in No Man's Sky. Fantastic builder and uh, really just, yeah, nice one Kibbles. And if you're wondering how the hell I did any of this, it's actually really easy. It's like, it's such a fantastic glitch. So I'll um, basically show you. So if we just pick up a wall here, just uh, whack a wall down. This is like the most simple thing. Um, this is actually how uh, Kibbles himself shows it, shows it in his video, which I'd highly recommend you check out later. He's got some awesome tutorials on building and such. So, essentially, you get whatever you want to play, so whether it be a wall or anything that's buildable. Let's say this. You get that in its green state, this green light, where it's ready to be placed. Then you press whatever button it is to bring up the delete and wire menu as well as the color menu so for pc that's control i believe it's l2 for ps4 and um, then like a fraction of a second after you let go of this menu uh, with the wire on you uh, obviously you take the cursor to wherever you want to place it using the dot of the actual cursor you press the build just after you let go and there we go. That is actually quite nicely centered. And that is now placed with its main sort of bottom, because that's how it was placed here, up like that. And you've now basically, you can snap to it and everything. It's fantastic. Now you might think that this massive room is definitely inside because it's, while well, it's five by five, it's pretty big. Um, it's got a full roof and everything. So, you know, this definitely counts inside, doesn't it? But the game might not see it that way. A lot of times when it's something, when there's open space this big, the game kind of thinks you're still outside. So if there's stuff like storms happening, they'll affect you because it thinks you're outside. So essentially just be wary of building two bigger places inside because it will often count as outside. There are ways to combat this. 
by doing such things as building some uh, large items, like even refines, I think, help. You can do stuff like uh, the storage. Um, these The storage definitely count. Obviously, they're a bit tricky to uh, place. You could, I suppose, get the uh, green light out there, do the wire glitch. So, green light, wire. And once you've got one in, it won't let you put it just like anywhere it says it will but it won't because of the flooring but you could put one on top and stuff you've uh, still got to glitch these in and such but uh having stuff like this helps uh for it to see that it's there's things in this space it helps to connect it all so uh yeah it's a bit of, it's a bit of a trick one this is if you're gonna build big do it on lush or you know stormless something like that it's bloody huge now I'm going to show you some things to do with conductivity. Now, as you can see, these buildings are powered, as are that light, that light, and that light. They are powered, which means, yeah, they're on. These aren't powered, so they're off. Uh, this building is the only thing out of all of this that is powered, and the building is conducting that power to lights that are placed on it without wires. Now, some parts aren't conducting power. Now this is a strange thing, I don't know what it's particularly choosing to be conductive, especially as we have like this area here, but it appears as though the edges that connect to the main buildings as well as the bottom is partly conductive, whereas a lot of the top isn't. Then with these it's all over, including the glass rooms and such. With these, another strange one, it's kind of like this, it's not to do with the glass or anything, it's just to do with the fact that it's not connected this side, but it is this side, so it's got power here and not there. Now, there's a very interesting thing which Dark Lord found, and uh, yeah, basically, they conduct over short space as well. So if you put one there, it lights those up as well. If you put one here, it powers those. If you put a single one here, it will power the entire line. None of these are connected by wires, just these top three. And you can do the same thing with these. Connect those. Connect. Oop. These don't want to connect for some reason. Those, for some reason, don't want to connect. Maybe it's to do with the distance. There we go. You just took a little extra distance there. Uh, you can do the same with these. Get those connected. Boom, shaboom. Take it up there. And essentially just connect them all via proximity. So conducting via proximity. Now another interesting thing is, you can use this to be able to hide all your wires on this type of building structure as well. Because these aren't powered, you can't power these blocks, these basic structures as I call them. But what you can do, which you may realise I've done here, is place them here. Oh, and that's lit. So is that, 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 that. And everything I put on this side will be lit. And that's because... I've powered the entire other side of it. So these being powered conducts the electricity to anything on, I put on this side, which allows me to hide wires. Obviously I've done this a bit ridiculous. If you're doing this, you'd just say, put that there if you want a light in the middle. And of course you'd have to actually wire it up. <laughs> so just wire that up and that is now lit and so we'll do the side B. Or, if you just want to do it like I like doing the lights around here. So if we just power that. And then uh, I like putting them on these joins because it kind of helps to bring everything together. Um, and that's now lit. So, yeah, that's uh, some useful ways that you can use the conductivity. It seems to be, from what Dark Lord has found, to be about 1U. Everything has to be within to conduct like this. Uh, so, yeah, it could be very useful. Now this next one is a little silly. I was apprehensive about showing this because it's kind of open to abuse. But it's also good to be warned of such things as if you see this. And whether the person who built it is a trusted source. But it's also could definitely be used for some really cool mazes and such. So this is basically a classic trap room. So you walk in here and the door closes behind you and you can't get out and yeah. You're basically now stuck in this room. First, you have to put the floor down, then the walls, 
And then before you put the roof in, you can put the door in now or after, it doesn't actually matter. Um, as we're on these menus, we'll just put it in now. Put the door in there. Uh, now, obviously, if you're going to use this, you'd, you wouldn't want this to be a complete trap thing, so you'd want, you know, another way to get out, uh, certainly. So, um, you can't actually put a pressure plate immediately down like this. It's too small of an area, and I think this might have been a protection against this kind of thing. I'm not sure. But what you can do is adjacency glitch it in. So... Adjacency glitch it in by pressing the build button and the right arrow or whatever it is on your platform pretty much at the same time. And yeah, there you go, it's now in. This will now be activated wherever you step within this small room or if you just have a corridor anywhere going near the door. And then just wire it up so that this is connected to the one uh, output. Oh, I've turned this around somehow. Uh, that's connected to the one output, and then this output is connected to a power source. Then, obviously, you'd want to put some kind of roof on, otherwise it's kind of pointless. And now, if you step in here, the door will close. Now, I've actually misaligned this very slightly. So, if you go up to the door, you're just about off the pad, but because uh, it's slightly too far this way. But if you get it perfectly centred, then... Uh, that won't be the case. So yeah, that's a little thing. Again, please don't abuse this. It's, uh, But it could be used for some really cool things. Now, I get it. This one looks pretty complicated. But don't worry, I'm going to explain it, I think, in a pretty good way. So, essentially, first we have the triggers. So, we've got pressure plate, which when you walk on it, powers want the output. Allows the current to go through. It's the same with the button when you interact with it. It allows a pulse to go through the button. This side's powered. That side goes to whatever you want to be powered. It lets it off for a couple of ticks. This one is a switch that basically you just turn on and off. And that allows the power to go through or not in a permanent toggled state. And then this is a proximity sensor, which if you're within about 10 U of it, it will uh, turn on and allow power through. So those are pretty useful. Those are the sort of input methods. Then we've got the inverter, this one. This will allow power to go through unless the modifier is turned on. So if we turn that off and don't provide power to the modifier, then power can go through. But if we add power to this third modifier input, then it turns the power off. This is an auto switch. This is kind of the opposite. This requires two inputs to be able to actually output. So if we turn one of these inputs off, it will not allow power through on the modifier. If we turn it back on, then power goes through. Happy days. Now, sometimes you might be in a situation, this is just an example. I know there's, not, there's often not going to be situations like this, but an example. You might want to turn only one, like, you might always want this to be on, no matter which one is clicked, but you might only want one of these. Now, to power them all up, current is just going to come back. So if, like, with this one powered but that not, it's still allowing power to go to this one and then to that one, but because this one is connected to that one as well, it will then travel through and light all three up. Whereas using auto switches, you can create a sort of one-way current. So... Because this requires two to be able to let power through, then it will go to this one, but it can't go back through the current because there's only one being uh, powered on this side, which allows you to power this and that from this side, and just this and that from this side. So essentially powering one thing as well with both, while powering another thing with only the specific one. I hope that was clear, and if you have any questions about this stuff, feel free to ask JC Hysteria and Kibbles and a few others who I'll link down below are doing loads of research into uh, the logic gates and different methods to use them, loads of different cool things, so uh, definitely check them out. 
for more stuff and like different perspectives. Different perspectives on the same thing I find always give a greater understanding of said thing. This is an extremely simple strobe circuit. So basically if you need anything to, well, strobe, then this is what you do. It basically works by these inputs here on both of these inverters are both powered. This output goes both to the light as well as to the, the modifier on this inverter. This inverter outputs the modifier on this inverter. So essentially they're on equal standing, um, both turning each other off. And because of how the game works with ticks and stuff, it essentially just strobes. So the way to make this is essentially you just get, go into tech, get your switches up, get two inverters. You then power both inverters. One of them goes to the light, which then also goes to the modifier of the other. The other one's output goes to modify input of the other. Now, at this point, this one has the sort of priority. Now, this is this essentially came from me doing trying uh, a toggle, an automatic so sort of circuit toggle, uh, by creating two equal states to then favour one, which would then turn that to the higher. So, uh, in order to get this to flash, which is why I don't use it as a toggle because it's inconsistent. Uh, get a button, then power that, put the button in the modifier of the one that's basically on, then go out and uh, basically just press a button. This will then destabilize it and it is now strobing. So just delete that and your circuit will just continue to strobe. Happy days. And now we have a very simple uh, automatic door which will open as you go up to it and close when you're away from it and open again when you go back up to it. This is a super, super simple little circuit. Essentially you have power going into an inverter. The inverter then goes through to the door. The modifier on the inverter is connected to a proximity sensor which will sense when you're within 10U of it and uh, that is powered also and then when you go in 10 within 10 u of it it will send this the current through which will uh, unpower the door and open it extremely simple you can put this proximity sensor pretty much anywhere near the door um, just make sure it's within like five u of it otherwise it's going to be a little while before you have to wait there for it to open um, you could also be quite evil and put it like 10 you in front of the door so once you go in it uh you won't activate the proximity sensor from the inside <laughs> why well, i don't know why i'm doing these showing these trap based things but anyway um and another really cool uh thing that you could use for bases that are like adventure bases that basically you've got an endpoint and exits and you have to work through a puzzle to get out and stuff like that. But of course, if you're doing that kind of thing, make sure you bloody warn people first and don't just share it so everyone gets trapped. That's just rude. And no one will like you. So yeah, that's just a cool little circuit. Super simple. Yeah, anyone can do it. Jobs are good. One. Oh, well, thank you, Dor. I do enjoy you. Now, all this ground that has taken over this crazy farm uh, may make you think that I'm talking about the terrain reclamation again, but I'm not. It's just an annoying thing that's happened. But it's fine because it's already built and I can access them. But uh, one that Lava mentioned the other day, which is just a genius little thought, is to, when you have a base like this and you have an off-site electricity source like that over there, then you're probably going to want to be able to, as you're building, check the levels. Now you could have a short range teleporter, but a way cheaper way, because you're not going to go there that often, would be to have a battery in the system. So if you go into your tech, go to power and industry, power, and select a battery, you can just connect your battery to your network. So just have it in a place where you can access it. I'll just put it to the side of this refiner, if it lets me. Um, then wire it in. Once it's connected, you can then use a battery to check out the system's power to see 
if you've got enough, what's going on, like how much have you got left before you're going to top out. Clearly, I have quite a bit extra. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think I needed this many. Well, actually I did, but it's uh, got almost a full one that's extra. But yeah, so it's great to have a battery to be able to check your power grid stats without having to go all the way over to your electronics or, you know, having a short range teleporter, which on permadeath could be a brutal thing because uh, as you know if you've done long range teleporting with the short range teleporter, the land doesn't always come immediately and you'll often fall through it and on permadeath that could be a bad thing because sometimes bugs can happen and uh, you don't last for a few seconds. Now here I'm going to show you a little bit about short range teleporters. Now this here, what you might see, is a little test I've done. I've done it several times now on different updates and I still haven't fixed it to be able to do it, unfortunately. This system should allow you to pick which teleporter you're going to go to. Now you go in here and you pick, say, number three. And it won't send you to number three. It'll send you, well, this time number four. And if you select, say, number one, it will also send you to number four. Now that is because it doesn't matter which one is powered. Now if you're curious about this system, essentially you press a button, the button that you press then powers, it goes up here, it hits a one-way circuit because basically going this way it will power both inputs so it will output but coming this way it can't it can't flow back basically which prevents it from uh, powering every teleporter so essentially when you press a button it powers both the teleporter you're standing in as well as the teleporter you're that you've chosen like the one two three or four and uh, this system should work but it doesn't because the teleporters don't work on which ones are powered also, teleporter wire, which they've just finally added in, uh, does not does not like uh, control anything. It just, yeah, it's just a different way to connect teleporters. So it doesn't actually do anything. It's broken at the moment. So I'm hoping that when they fix this, this will be a nice system, which obviously I'll show you guys how to make, um, that will allow you to have any number of teleporters in your base with a very simple, like this is really simple, um, selector with a button that you just press and it sends you to the one you want also if you have teleporters wired into the system but they're not powered but the one that you walk into is it will still send you to an unpowered one so yeah teleporters just stick to two at the moment a back and forth that, that's all you can currently trust until they fix it at which point i'll make a guide about how to do selectors and such now I'm just going to briefly go over a few complexity values. Now, we don't actually have the full complexity yet. I haven't gathered that all from the files yet, but don't worry, that is coming. A full list of the complexity, which appears to be now back in action, at least for the moment. But a few tips of things to avoid. So wood in general takes far more processing power to work with than concrete or metal. So if you're doing a big build, avoiding wood in general is a good idea for performance. The more wood you have, the slower it's going to make your computer in comparison to using like steel or something. Whereas concrete, concrete is kind of the midway in a bunch of, in a bunch of points. Largely concrete stairs, so, for instance, are the worst stairs for performance. They are ridiculous. They look the best and they're the only two that when you connect them like this actually are flush with each other. Wood and metal have a gap in the middle and these look amazing side by side. So I use them at times but they are like three times the performance requirement than wood and metal. Metal are the lowest by far. The concrete, the concrete floors aren't too bad but they're not the best. When it comes to the best for this kind of thing, for the most part, it's metal. Metal flooring is by far the most processor friendly for most things. There are certain things like concrete walls. The walls in particular are the best, 
a large thing would be to basically just avoid wood. Things that look plainer, like con the concrete walls look the plainest out of the walls. And that's because they are. They've got less bumps, they've got less differences in colour, which means they have less requirements for processing power. The metal flooring actually have quite a few extra little bits, but it's still nothing in comparison to wood by far and concrete by a bit. A top tip I learned from Mr. John Hall, um, which I've used many a times and just never really thought about it before he said it, but it's very useful. Essentially, a lot of times you'll want to keep the terrain looking good. You don't want it to auto terrain like this, where it destroys the grass and will eventually grow back anyway and overtake the flooring and stuff. So it's a really good idea to keep your buildings off the ground, like the ground floor. And you can do this very easily by just using short walls or regular walls, uh, which will phase through the ground without causing any issue, to then put your building on top. You can also use arches to create sort of stilts for the house. These can then go under and phase in nicely, which gives you a base without destroying the terrain. Just a little tip there. This next one is all about if you find a beautiful spot that you want to build a base, then uh, you just want to get straight on with it. So it's really good to have a awesome ship, usually a hauler, that is filled with lots of cool stuff. So uh, I have such a ship and uh, it is this baller which I recently picked up. So just call it down, that is now classed as my ship and this ship has a whole lot of stuff on. It's got carbon, ferrite dust in the tens of thousands, condensed carbon, oxygen, cobalt, ionized sodium, nitrate, some glass, dihydrogen, tritium, mordite, every plant, every biome, material, it's got besom, chromatic metal, platinum, gold, silver, pugnium, some warp hyper cores, advanced iron batteries, a whole stack of them, navigation data, wiring loom. Basically, if I need anything, so I don't have to go to a station or something, I have a ship with a crap ton of stuff in as a backup. Now, obviously, you can keep a lot in your cargo, but it's really good to have this ship. This has a load of building materials that I can just start building with, but it also has other stuff that I might need for, say, damage technology or just anything. So building some kind of tech on my exosuit, so I don't have to go to the space station. Also, as far as technology, it's set up for as a building ship. So it's got a teleport receiver to extend the range that you can take and... Uh, give items between your inventory and the ship. It's also got a launch recharger in case I just leave it and uh, so I never have to worry about recharging it. Even though it does have uranium and stuff, it's just, there's a free spot, why not? It's also got an economy scanner for finding trading posts on the planet if I'm building or just exploring. So yeah, really useful to have such a ship. This specific ship was a crash ship that I picked up, uh, showed it in a video the other day, so uh, check that out if you want to go and get it. It's basically free. Swish. This next tip is to be careful on building close to portals. Portals can be iffy because Hello Games have put a lot of things into effect to prevent you from blocking portals and such with your buildings and trapping people inside them and all that. So, in order to do this, they've kind of made it difficult to build near a portal. Now, you can build a base far enough away, which we believe, before Beyond anyway, was 525U from the portal, is the minimum distance you need to be away from it. As long as your base computer's outside of that, it should still upload. And from recent evidence since Beyond, it appears as though some, if you then extend your boundary toward the portal, some things will be visible, potentially things like wires and lights and such, whereas walls probably won't unless you're in multiplayer with the person. It's a very iffy thing at the moment, a lot more testing needs to be done, but essentially this is purely just to warn you about building too close to portals. If you have a portal base that is just right on the portal, no one's going to ever see that, unless they join your game. Now I'll show you a few farms, well, two to be specific. 
This everybody is a activated Indian farm. It is the highest passive income farm. Basically you just farm it, you then collect it and sell it and you're done. It creates a ridiculous amount. Each activated Indium on the galactic average, which is the base value plus 10%, is worth 1044 units per one and you can get a thousand per hour per extractor from an S-Class activated Indium deposit. This is my survival save. Um, I, this is all I had time to build in the stream in the end because, yeah, that. Because, you know, pylons, and they do look good. I'm so happy I did that. They look friggin' awesome. But this alone, this has 12 silos, which all carry 1,000 each. That's 12,000. Those carry 250 each storage-wise. That's 12,750 activated indium. One of these, over a week's time can fill 68 of these so yeah essentially all you do is find an s-class activated indium deposit or even a lower one stick down some extractors multiply the amount of extractors you have by the amount of hours that will be between each harvest and then make that many silos and yeah just Come along and in that period and uh, grab your activated indium from one of your supply depots. There we go, 12,750 there for me. Waiting there and that's worth 12 million units. So that's nice. And uh, just sell it at a... Uh... Yeah, I wish I hadn't... I'm not sure I should have chosen a high security planet, but you know, I did. If you want a more full like map and stuff for, for this type of farm, just let me know and I'll sort it out. Next we have this, which is a chlorine farm. Now you might think chlorine, hmm, oh, you might fall through the floor, that's odd. You might think uh, it is a big farm, it's friggin' cute. You might think chlorine is a weird thing to farm, but it's really not. Essentially, you are farming oxygen. Now if we look in here, this uh, gathers a total of 542,000 oxygen per harvest. This can be harvested every four hours, roughly. This farm will make the unit cap 4.3 billion units per day. Essentially what you do is you take the oxygen from here, you uh, head into these and uh, basically put chlorine and oxygen to make six chlorine from one chlorine and two oxygen. You basically just keep doing that so it is semi-passive, it's not passive at all. It's the highest semi-passive. Uh, there is also another farm type which is which has an even higher one, which is a fully active farm, which uh, I will be doing soon. But yeah, so if you want to go on the more semi-passive, this has a higher output than activated indium by about 60% per unit mined. Um, so yeah, the chlorine farm. If you want to see how to do this, I did a huge guide, uh, which I'll link down below, 4.3 billion farm. So yeah, check that out. This is a terrible showing of it because I've only got the main unit and the upgrade. I've got no modules, but uh, one method for getting your ferrite dust, carbon, dihydrogen and other such things that don't require a special weapon to mine is to shoot them with your ship. Get geodes and all sorts. Remember that everything that you pick up will go into your ship's inventory, so make sure you've got space. And uh, yeah, just shoot away. Try to pick a better planet than this. This is a terrible planet for us. Terrible planet with a terrible weapon. Actually, it's not that bad. They're everywhere. It's just a terrible weapon. Okay, folks, and here is the final idea, tip, thing I'm going to do. As you can probably tell from this, it is a combination lock. Not just any combination lock, a 16 digit combination lock. So, <laughs> um, right, obviously, people have made these already. Um, Boyd Gaming was known as the first uh, to sort of get one out there in the world. Um, JC's made one. I don't know if Kibbles has made one. But basically, I have purposefully avoided watching the videos for their designs because I wanted to just... I like coming up with my own little designs of this. So as soon as I'm finished with this video, I'm going to look at theirs and see how it compares. Um, I've gone with a fairly simple design... I don't know if I could make it more simple, to be honest. I've literally given this 30 minutes, because uh, I know I can make one. 
and I've just come up with this. So, right. <laughs> I Saying that, I'm very confident this is a very good idea. Right, so basically, the combination for this is... Uh, this is hexadecimal, 0 to F, so 1, which is the second one, 2, 3, 4, I know it's inventive, 5, then it gets a little more complicated, so that's 6, 7, 8, 9, A, A is the next one, B, C, and E, and with that, it opens with any different whatsoever if that's on nope not gonna open buddy I'm sorry with uh, one of these off just a random one there nope not gonna open so this needs of course every single one that is on now to be on and every single one that is off to be off now I'll quickly show you how this works it's super simple like it now this is gonna look complicated it really isn't complicated i've literally just got my generators here and with batteries just in case they run out while i was doing stuff so this looks complicated i assure you it's not just give me a chance to explain so every single one of those that is off goes out to this back wall all of them are connected to each other this is because if i any of those are on then this will prevent this signal from getting through it just mo goes into the modifier of an inverter so that will stop this signal from going through now this signal is the power going to the door so if you're stopping this from going through this will turn this inverter on which will power the door and stop it from working now in order for the signal to also get through there this needs to be on so this needs to be powered the only way for this to be powered is if every single one of these auto switches which there are nine because there are nine of the buttons you must press to uh, be able to get through so if any single one of these auto isn't powered by the modifier which each one of these is individually attached to a modifier then the signal can't get through here which means it can't get through and the door is powered so just one last way going through it the opposite way this is the power that goes through. So this power needs to reach this in order for the door to be open. So it goes through here, goes through all of these auto switches, every single one. The only way it will get through every single one is if all of these auto switches are powered. Because that's how auto switches work. They need two inputs. So this needs to be powered here and needs to be powered there. This needs to be powered here, and needs to be powered there, and so on through all of them, going through this line. So the only way the power goes from here, reaches all the way through here, and goes down here, is if every single one of the buttons connected to these modifiers are turned on. So those are the ones that need to be turned on. But if, and that brings it down to here, but if any of the ones that need to be turned off are on, any single one of them, this will be powered, which prevents it from going through here and so that's essentially it I know it looks really complicated it's just because there's 16 of them I don't know what I thought I'll do 16 because you know it's no one's going so yes folks thank you for watching this long ass building tips and tricks video I hope I hope you've learned some things if the if there's anything at all not just to do with this if you're confused about anything please say in the comments I'll be happy to uh, try and clear that up so yeah if you like this kind of thing just let me know and um, yeah I'll see if I can do more like this type video in the future um, we have a website that's linked in the pinned comment same as a discord with loads of awesome people linked in the pinned comment we got merch if you want to support the channel and get something tangible yourself t-shirts super soft uh, really nice tri blend uh, really light, good for like the hot days and stuff. We've got hoodies for the cold days, with super light again and comfy. And yeah, check it out. Thanks for watching, folks. And just to please have a fantastic day. Now I'm going to go and check out JC and Boyd's design, see how they differ. Hmm.
It should be fun. And I highly recommend you guys do the same. I've linked a load of builders' channels and stuff down below in the pinned comment. Uh, especially people who have been, who've mentioned in the video and then others like Action Pants Gaming, ER Burrows and stuff. Check them out. They're awesome. Have a great day. Oh, yeah.